Welcome to AgriPulse Newsmakers, where we aim to take you to the heart of ag policy. I'm Spencer Chase. Our guest this week is Congressman Tracy Mann, who joins us to discuss government funding and the upcoming Farm Bill. But first, here's this week's headlines. The Biden administration is committing another $2.9 billion to fund global food security efforts. Most of the money will go to the U.S. Agency for International Development, but the Department of Agriculture will also receive about $220 million for school feeding projects in Africa and East Asia. There's also another $178 million for international development projects across four continents. President Joe Biden says the investments are necessary to address the nearly 193 million people facing acute food insecurity around the world, a 40 million person increase. The Senate Ag Committee held a hearing Thursday on two more USDA nominees. Oregon Agriculture Director Alexis Taylor is President Biden's nominee to be Undersecretary for Trade. Jose Esteban, a longtime veteran of USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, is nominated to be Undersecretary for Food Safety. The hearing also included Vincent Logan's nomination to be a board member for the Farm Credit Administration. Taylor's nomination has been of special interest to farm groups eager to see more emphasis on ag trade priorities in the Biden administration. And finally, congressional leaders are still trying to agree on a continuing resolution to avoid a government shutdown on October 1st. West Virginia Democrat Joe Manchin's permitting reform efforts have proven to be a major sticking point on Capitol Hill. For agriculture, disaster aid spending will likely have to wait until December when Congress is expected to address a funding package for the remainder of the fiscal year after passing a shorter-term measure next week. Child nutrition advocates are hoping the CR will include provisions to provide free school meals to all children, regardless of their family income. The lack of certainty on government funding is a growing frustration for many on Capitol Hill, including Kansas Republican Tracy Mann. He tells AgriPulse he'd like to see the situation resolved. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of behind the scenes talk. Uh, Spencer, it frustrates me. You know, no farmer would wait until 10 days before the crop needs to be planted to decide what they're going to plant. You know, these things should be decided long ahead of time. In the same way, the federal government uh, runs out of money on September 30th, and here we are September 21st, and uh, and nothing's done yet. It's very frustrating to me. No way that we should be uh, operating. Um, and in my view, uh, lack of uh, mismanagement and a, a lack of a desire to really make tough decisions and get things done. Uh, quickly here, we're hearing uh, some conversation about whether or not agricultural disaster spending uh, will be included uh, in this upcoming uh, in this upcoming spending package. Is that something you're hearing is going to be addressed uh, in in the CR or perhaps in an omnibus that might be considered in uh, in uh, December? I, I, you know, lo- lots of chatter. I think more likely in an omnibus. It certainly um, appears any CR is going to be a short term, you know, kick the can down the road. I think the uh, discussion is, is that, you know, into December 15th or is that on into January? But I think uh, omnibus is more likely with that one. Mm-hmm. Well, and sticking with the ag disaster conversation, you know, a lot of work being done to get that provisions included uh, within the spending package, uh, you know, no matter when it might be passed. A lot of folks uh, pushing for that on Capitol Hill, a lot of farm groups pushing for it as well. There's also been some conversation about whether or not the, the continuous ad hoc disaster conversation is something that should happen uh, every time that there's a, a derecho, a hurricane, a tornado, what have you and uh, instead pursuing a some kind of permanent disaster language in the upcoming Farm Bill. What would be your thoughts on, on that kind of a concept? Uh, my thought is I think we sure ought to look at it. You know, these ad hoc over and over and over again, given um, what the uh, weather's been doing the last few years, you know, there seems to be, there, there would be more efficient and better ways to do that. So I absolutely think it's something we should look at. What that ends up looking like, uh, I think is to be determined and we're in the very early stages of that. I do know this, I do know the crop insurance is is and should be, continue to be an essential part of the farm safety net. I look at Western Kansas where I'm from, where I represent, you know, we have total crop losses of corn, um, sorghum, you know, due to lack of rainfall. On the, uh, you know, on the, the risk management standpoint, uh, how do you thread that needle then between a permanent disaster program and still maintaining uh, and, and keeping actuarially sound the current crop, uh, crop insurance program? Yeah, well, I think the most important thing is we've got to, we've got to protect crop insurance. And, you know, we got to make sure that any changes made to this farm bill in regards to crop insurance specifically, you know, that we use a scalpel 
and not a sledgehammer. You know, I envision that this uh, sure seems like this farm bill, Spencer, is going to be evolutionary, but not revolutionary. Um, so are there some tweaks? Are there some improvements? Absolutely. Um, do we need to make major changes specific to crop insurance? I don't believe that we do. I think producers like it. It's working. Uh, we need to make sure that it is strengthened moving forward. I want to ask you about some other topics, but while we're on the uh, while we're on the farm bill conversation, curious as you have conversations with your uh, producers in your uh, home state, in your districts, uh, and as you consider that with your staff, what do you expect uh, uh, Congressman Mann's top priority will be in the upcoming farm bill discussion? Uh, the top priority by far will be crop insurance, and you know it's just so essential to to our ag producers in in Kansas and and around the country. Uh, also, we need to be looking at trade. Uh, specifically, you know, the MAP, you know, market assets program. I think that those are good. There's a great return on investment of those dollars spent. Uh, the continued future of agriculture has to be in expanding markets and creating demand um, outside of our borders. So that's big for me. And also, Spencer number three is going to be oversight. You know, there's all these things that are happening in the federal government today that that impacts our ag producers. So we need oversight on things like waters of the U.S., on things like the 30 by 30 land grab, these other things that are coming at us. So my three priorities are crop insurance, trade, and oversight. We'll be right back with more from Congressman Mann right after this. Regenerative poultry production is a process by which nature can actually recapture and restore the energy that is being taken out of a space. Farm Credit helped Rehi build his dream of regenerative poultry farming and encouraging fellow immigrants to find community in agriculture. Nothing beats a farm. I'm just pursuing happiness. Learn more at farmcredit.com slash beginning. Every morning, American corn farmers roll their sleeves up and start the work of growing a better future, one bushel at a time with America's crop. A better future made possible by their unmatched sustainability practices and the extraordinary benefits and uses of corn throughout the global economy. And the National Corn Growers Association proudly supports and advocates for all they do year in and year out. Welcome back. The subject of new money and whether or not it is needed for the upcoming Farm Bill is a hot topic on Capitol Hill. When we spoke to Congressman Mann, we asked him the thoughts of the Republican caucus on the subject and whether or not that will be an issue headed into the upcoming legislation. Yeah, we're just going to have to get into it and see, you know, we have an election coming up. We'll see who's actually on the Ag Committee because that's going to change somewhat between now and then. Surely one method for funding a farm bill and farm bill programs are strengthen, or strengthen existing one is new money, um, which makes the farm bill bigger as a package. But also a much better way to fund the bill is to exhaust all opportunities to reallocate uh, funding from unused or, or outdated programs as well. So we need to take a hard look at that before we really know what potential gaps and shortfalls may be. If, uh, if folks come to you and ask for new money, is that, is that an idea that you would support? Uh, we're just gonna have to look at it. Uh, it. It's so early in the process, uh, Spencer, that it's really hard to uh, to say until we know because it depends on what's the new money for, what's it going towards. It, did just a blanket, you know, more money for the farm bill. You know, a lot of the farm bills we know is food nutrition programs. You know, and so without knowing the specifics, it, that that's a, a question that's pretty impossible to answer at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and you mentioned the idea of reallocation. Obviously, it's a very uh, uh, tricky needle to thread there because a lot of folks on the Democratic side of the aisle might hear talk of uh, reallocation and be concerned that money might be taken out of nutrition programs and put into farm programs. How, how does that needle get threaded politically? Uh, if you know, In the event that Republicans are in control of the House, can a farm bill be produced that uh, still adequately supports nutrition and farm programs and gets a signature from a Democratic president? Um, I believe that it can. You know, it's all about um, ROI, return on investment. We've got to look uh, where are we investing dollars for agriculture uh, and other programs, and what's the return to the taxpayer for those things? Without question, Spencer, uh, you know, this country is the great nation it is in large part because we've never had to rely on another country for our food supply. Uh, you know, food security is, uh, ag policy is national security. And we got to drive that home. We got to make sure that that never changes. And I think with what we're seeing in the world today, that that's going to be a pretty easy value proposition. We've got to focus on the return on investment uh, for to make sure that taxpayer dollars are used as efficiently and as effectively as possible. 
I want to wrap up here talking about some legislation that we've seen uh, quite a bit of action on in the Senate side of Capitol Hill, but not as much on the House side. And that's a proposal by some senators over there to uh, decide uh, or to uh, introduce some new language on how uh, cattle price discovery would work uh, in the in the beef industry. Uh, seen. Uh, hearings on that on the Senate side of Capitol Hill, uh, seen basically just bill introduction at this point on the House side of Capitol Hill. Why do you think we haven't seen the same level of action on the House side of the bill uh, that we've seen in the Senate? Um, I think we've not seen it because there's a lot of genuine concerns with what that would do to the market. You know, I grew up on a farm. We have a preconditioning feed yard. Our family still owns and, and, and has that. My district's the number one beef producing district in the country. And I'm for freedom and I have concerns about restricting uh, you know, producers' ability to market their product to make sure that they're rewarded to uh, producing a better product. And so I think the reason we've not seen it as much on the House side is there has not been um, the support um, for it on the House side. So, I mean, you mentioned sort of the lack of activity in the, in the House side on that piece of legislation, the lack of interest, uh, but you've got a lot of producers in your state, as you mentioned. Also, a lot of uh, packers have a presence in your state. And so uh, you've got a lot of competing interests to to deal with within your own constituency. And so I'll ask you, if, if this legislation is not the answer, then in your opinion, what is? Well, we got to acknowledge there's an ongoing Department of Justice investigation. I think it's long overdue, and we've been calling on the administration to give an update on where that stands and or um, wrap that up um, so we know if anything illegal is happening. Beyond that, you know, we need to be watching to see if the market's working. We have seen cattle prices move up here over the last, uh, you know, last few months. Certainly every indication is with supplies going down, um, prices should continue and uh, and we'll, you know, work to make sure and, and see if that happens. A uh, big picture, though, I, I'm not a believer in restricting the free market, and uh, and I don't believe that the government should be dictating to our ag producers how they should market their product. And quickly here, as we wrap up, Congressman, uh, absent some kind of action, uh, potential action on the on this bill in the current Congress, is this something you're expecting to discuss in the upcoming farm bill? Oh, you know, I'm not hearing any rumblings of that. Um, I, I've not been in any meeting where it's been talked about of uh, this potentially being added to the farm bill. You know, of course, anything could happen as we get into it. But but at this time, I don't expect that to be the case. Congressman, thanks for joining us. Great. Thank you. We'll be right back to hear from this week's panel. But first, our Hannah Pagel takes a look at USDA's lagging enforcement of a key law when it comes to foreign farmland purchases in this week's Ag by the Numbers. USDA's tracking of foreign land ownership relies heavily on investors to voluntarily report acquisitions. But an AgriPulse analysis of federal data shows enforcement cases have dropped dramatically, even as the number of transactions has surged over the past decade. This chart shows the number of land parcels acquired by foreign investors annually from 2010 to 2021. It's important to note these figures are not representative of total land ownership and do not include sales by foreign investors, which are also tracked. You can see the number of parcels acquired by investors started rising substantially in 2016, creating more forms for USDA employees to sift through. More than 6,300 parcels were purchased by a total of 323 investors in 2021. By law, foreign investors who do not report their land purchases to USDA within 90 days can incur a late fee worth 0.1% of the land's value for each week purchases go unreported. The penalty is capped at 25%. USDA frequently reduces the fines companies could face, including one potential fine that dropped more than $21 million to about $120,000. Why the big reduction? Since the program relies on self-reporting, federal officials worry imposing massive penalties could lead to companies choosing not to disclose their purchases, despite it being required by law. Noah Wicks has a deeper look at the issue and the work on Capitol Hill to address it in his coverage on agripulse.com. For this week's Ag by the Numbers, I'm Hannah Pagel. Farmers are always there for each other. We shed tears together, we celebrate together, but we also grow together. Farm Bureau is the largest general farm organization in the country. We have the farmers back. If you're a farmer and you're not a member, we would welcome you into our Farm Bureau family. And if you want to know more about agriculture, come be part of this great family. At Clean Fuels Alliance America, we're working toward a future of clean energy now that will make our members proud. 
We serve as the clean fuels industry's primary organization for technical, environmental, and quality assurance programs, and are the strongest voice for its advocacy, communications, and market development. With industry-leading programs and incentives, Clean Fuels Alliance America is actively moving the clean fuels industry forward toward a brighter future. Welcome back to AgriPulse Newsmakers, where we're excited to be joined by this week's panel to continue our discussion on farm policy as it relates to the Farm Bill and other uh, provisions within it. Joined this week by Mark Dopp with the North American Meat Institute, Ariel Wiegard with the American Soybean Association, and Jake Westland with the National Association of Wheat Growers. Appreciate all of you taking the time to join us. And, and Jake, I want to go to you first, because uh, the question that is on a lot of people's mind is whether or not uh, farm groups and, and the nation's producers will be able to rely on some additional support that might come from uh, this uh, upcoming farm bill, things like increased reference prices, for example. Wondering, what do you think farm groups can do to make their uh, needs better understood on Capitol Hill? Well, that's an excellent question, and, and thank you so much for the opportunity today. So I think really one of the important things that uh, grower organizations and farmers continue to do as we're just over a year out from reauthorizing the next farm bill is continue to tell our story and highlight some of the challenges and experiences that producers have had over the last uh, several years. So for instance, for, from a wheat perspective, uh, there's been a lot of increased market volatility uh, that a lot of our growers have had to face, particularly following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We saw uh, winter wheat prices in the mid $7 range in February, jump to over $13.5 in, in mid-May, and then coming back down to about $8.20. $8 so that volatility has never really been seen before. and and threatens the marketing infrastructure in place for a lot of farmers. In addition to that, uh, there's been a lot of uh, additional increases in, in input costs. You've seen fertilizer almost double, and you, see, you still see diesel really high up there. So those challenges are important to continue to communicate to legislators and their staff as, as farmers and, and lawmakers continue to look towards the next farm bill and consider things like potentially increasing the reference price for wheat growers, as well as look at supporting crop insurance and maybe trying to find some enhancements in that area to help uh, provide that certainty and, and reinforce that, that uh, support system in place for, for producers. Well, and, and Ariel, a lot of looks uh, right now at the conservation uh, aspects of the Farm Bill. A lot of uh, lead up uh, to the Farm Bill has also included some uh, studying of some conservation funding, including some additional investments from the Inflation Reduction Act. We saw uh, recently the Department of Agriculture investing some money in the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities program. Wondering, is, does ASA believe that's going to be a sufficient level of, uh, of additional investment in uh, the nation's conservation programs, or will another crack at this be needed in the Farm Bill as well? Great question, Spencer, and uh, just like Jake, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you all today. Um, you know, we, we certainly hope so, that this is sufficient funding for conservation. You know, conservation program funding is a, a priority for soybean farmers, and we all know that these programs are oversubscribed. NRCS is only able to fund a, a fraction of producer applications to participate, so, so that is a priority for us. And when you look at the incredible response to USDA's Climate Smart Commodities Initiative, it's, it's really easy to point to the energy and momentum around conservation. So we have a really good story to tell on the Hill. Uh, on, on the flip side, though, you know, we can't ignore the bigger picture. And, you know, Jake already uh, spoke to this a little bit, but the fact is that there are many areas in the farm bill that need increased investment. You know, those Title I farm programs need a fresh look. Uh, we need funding for research, for rural development, trade promotion. Um, the uh, nutrition title is certainly going to have a spotlight on it next week's White House conference on hunger, nutrition, and health. And, uh, you know, Congress has, has told us that outside of the Inflation Reduction Act, there's probably not going to be much new funding available across the farm bill. So, you know, while, while conservation program funding is a priority for us and, and we hope that this will be sufficient, I think we're also trying to be realistic about the fact that there are going to be a lot of hard conversations and hard choices to make next year. Mm-hmm. 
Well, and Mark, bringing you into the fold here, I, I mean, you, you might uh, say say otherwise uh, based on your experience on the issue versus mine, but it seems to me from the chair I'm sitting in, uh, a ton of interest, uh, more than usual, in, in some cattle politics legislation over these last couple of years, uh, you know, between the Grassley-Fisher legislation and even off of Capitol Hill, we see things like the Department of Justice uh, weighing into the space. Wondering, as, as the North American, or excuse me, uh, is the Meat Institute prepares for the upcoming Farm Bill, what are you all anticipating will be uh, in, in terms of things uh, on, on NAMI's agenda going into that legislation, given the current political climate of the cattle sector? Well, Spencer, thanks for the question. And I, I will echo my colleagues and appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I, you know, I, I, one of my colleagues likes to quote our former boss, um, Senator uh, Roberts, who says, with respect to the farm, the hope springs eternal. Now, with respect to what the meat industry, the meat institute is interested with respect to the farm bill, you know, that, that's that's probably, you know, from a livestock perspective, um, you, I think you were, I think you were alluding to the, the Grassley-Fisher bill, for example, uh, which Senator Grassley and Senator Fisher have been pushing, um, you know, from our perspective, I'm not sure that that is something that, that warrants being included in the farm bill. In fact, we don't think it should be. Uh, we think that, that the concept of, of mandating uh, cash cash acquisitions or capital purchases by, by packers is a solution in search of a problem. I mean, all you have to do is look at what's happened in the market over the past year or so. Uh, admittedly, during, the, during COVID, prices were low, uh, but the market has changed. Uh, I was reading something about 10 days ago that says live cattle prices are nearing record highs. They haven't been as high as they are now uh, since 2015. And if you look at what's happening out in the, you know, on the countryside in terms of liquidation, cow sales, et cetera, and, and everything else attended to that, um, it's entirely possible that those prices are even going to go higher over the next year or so. So, you know, I'm not, again, with respect to a farm bill, I, I think some of these issues are, again, a solution in search of a problem. We'll be right back to continue our conversation with our panel right after this. Agriculture Future of America is a nonprofit building transformational leaders in food and agriculture. AFA prepares college students to join the workforce as innovative and engaged young professionals who will shape the future of agriculture. Head to agfuture.org to find out how you can get involved. Welcome back. The Department of Agriculture recently invested money through the Partnerships for Climate Smart Commodities program into pilot projects for commodities across the country. When we spoke to Ariel Wiegard with the American Soybean Association, we asked her whether or not that program and its pilot projects within it will receive attention in the upcoming Farm Bill. First, I would say that our policy positions are decided by our farmers, not by the lobbyists here in D.C., and this isn't something that we've talked about with them yet, so I don't want to get out in front of them on this. Um, but, you know, we, we are very excited about these climate smart commodity announcements. I think over a third of the funding is for projects that have at least a, a partial focus on soy. So there's great opportunity to help our, our producers here, uh, including through the Farmers for Soil Health project with our partner, the United Soybean Board, uh, the corn growers and the pork industry. I have to give them a shout out. Um, you know, and so, so we really appreciate uh, on a couple of levels the, the investment that the secretary has made in opening new market opportunities for our farmers. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the farm bill, you know, when, when you think about any investment, we want to see a return on that investment. And it's, it's going to take time to prove out whether whether this approach works. You know, we're going to be following these projects closely. We're going to be looking to see how quickly USDA gets funding out the door, uh, you know, how, how quickly and effectively the funding gets to farmers, how successful the projects are at getting conservation on the ground. Um, you know, I think that USDA has probably has the right idea in leaning on public-private partnerships, but with with the vast number of partners that are included in in these projects, that also leaves a lot of room for for error and for learnings about what works and what doesn't. Uh, you know, not just in terms of conservation, but also in terms of process and implementation. So. Um, Again, not an official policy position at this point, but I would say it, it may be premature to codify a program like this in the Farm Bill, but, but we'll see. Our policy might change on this in the next couple of months. 
Well, and, and Jake, a lot of folks also looking at uh, disaster spending in the upcoming Farm Bill and wondering whether or not some kind of permanent disaster language might be a, a good idea in the upcoming legislation as opposed to ad hoc spending like we're seeing right now through the appropriations process uh, being pushed for. What would uh, something like a permanent disaster program mean for the nation's wheat producers? Yeah, and this is something that we've been continuing to have conversations with uh, as, as we outlined our priorities earlier this summer and as we continue to have these conversations going into the fall. Uh, but from our perspective, we I mean, you know there's been a lot of efforts looking at establishing a permanent disaster aid program. But from our perspective, uh, we've been focused on crop insurance as our number one priority and making sure that uh, if there is a disaster aid program, that it work for, for, for row crops and for wheat growers. And, and additionally, that we make sure that we're not disincentivizing participation in, in crop insurance. But from the past several disaster aid programs that we've seen through ERP, WIP, WIP Plus, and the Quality Loss Adjustment Program, uh, the, there have been some challenges with it, those uh, rollouts as it relates to wheat growers. ERP has been really good, at least in the first phase, from the feedback that we've heard from growers. Uh, there is another tranche that we do participate in that phase too. Uh, but as we look back at WIP Plus and QLA, we've had some challenges with how those programs have worked for wheat growers, what documentation that needed to be to had uh, that wasn't always readily available uh, with some of those programs. And additionally, uh, with a lot of uh, wheat producers in the United States, most of that production is winter wheat, so planted in the fall, harvested in the following year. So a lot of just issues with, uh, with that and being uh, recognized through those programs. And additionally, some other things that we had, uh, particularly with the droughts and stuff, uh, we saw a lot of positive improvements through that legislation and that was made in the continuing resolution last year uh, that recognized uh, some of those losses in the D2 for eight weeks. That was, there was a lot of areas throughout the countryside that was just hanging on and never actually got into D3 in previous ones, which was a requirement for, for WIP Plus. But in, in ERP, uh, that was a, a good positive change that was seen there. But I think just the bottom line as we continue to look at this next farm bill uh, and, and recognizing the, the limited dollars that are available. Um, while it might be good to have some sort of uh, authorizing language for permanent disaster aid program, I think from our perspective at, at, at the moment right now in short of seeing proposals for a permanent disaster aid program is uh, continuing to protect and strengthen uh, crop insurance and looking at getting an increase in a reference price there. But there could be some opportunities in that uh, permanent disaster aid space. Okay. And, and Mark, we'll wrap up uh, with, uh, with you here. And, and I, I'm wondering if you can maybe zoom out from uh, industry specific priorities and just look at kind of the contours of Washington, obviously heading into a midterm election and which, uh, which uh, party will be in control of which chamber is yet to be determined by the American people uh, here in November. But wondering, uh, the president's not going to change. The administration's not going to change. Uh, yes, Republicans could control the House and or the Senate uh, for the upcoming uh, farm bill process. But wondering, how do you anticipate the, uh, the politics uh, will will play out here as as we see uh, Republicans look to gain control of one of the chambers, but still work to advance a piece of farm bill legislation that will need the signature of a Republican president. What are you going to be watching for in this process? Well, I think uh, you mean a Democratic president, right? Um, I, you know, speculating on what's going to happen in the election is probably something better left to the to the professional lobbyists. Um, I, I, you know, in the Senate whether it stays in Democratic control or, or shifts to the Republicans, it's going to be thin either way, uh, which means hopefully people will come together and, and, you know, come together to get some solutions. And, you know, I, I'm not in a position, I don't think anybody's in a position today to really make a decision or call. I mean, the general consensus seems to be that the Republicans will take back the House. But depending on which media outlet you listen to or, or like, uh, it could be a substantial majority or it could be as thin as it is today for the Democrats. In either event, however that shakes out, if we're going to get a farm bill done and whether there's going to be any livestock title in there it remains to be seen. But if you're going to get a farm bill done, I hope everybody realizes that they need to work together to achieve that result. So that's, that, that is the best um, uh, educated speculation I can give you is that if nothing else we've learned, people need to collaborate rather than throw stones at each other. 
Very good. Well, that's one of many things we're going to be watching in this upcoming farm bill process, in addition to some of the disaster discussions that we've had, as well as conservation spending. Uh, no shortage of things to cover for this upcoming farm bill process and no shortage of people to talk about them with. And I certainly appreciate the three that decided to join us here today. Folks, thanks for joining us. We'll be right back with more AgriPulse newsmakers. But first, our Hannah Pagel takes a look at nationwide food insecurity in this week's Map It Out. New figures from the Department of Agriculture show food insecurity is a nationwide problem, but it's a bigger concern in certain parts of the country. This chart from USDA shows how food insecurity in each state compares to the national average from 2019 to 2021. The national average of food insecurity was 10.4%. You can see many of the nine states above that average are in the southeastern part of the country. There are 15 states below the national average, the remaining 27 states are near the national average. Food insecure households are those that had difficulty providing enough food for everyone in the house at some time during the year because they didn't have enough money or resources. This topic is one of many expected to be addressed at next week's White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. It's the first time such an event will be held in more than 53 years. Reporting for AgriPulse, I'm Hannah Pagel. Did you know AgriPulse has all your favorite podcasts, including Open Mic, Newsmakers, and Drive Time. Take us wherever you go. Subscribe at agripulse.com or on Spotify, Google Play, or Apple Podcasts. Thanks again for tuning in for another episode of AgriPulse Newsmakers. Before we let you go, here's what's on the horizon for the upcoming week. Many prominent figures in farm policy will be joining us Monday for the Ag Outlook Forum held in conjunction with the Kansas City Ag Business Council. Then on Wednesday, the White House will convene its conference on hunger, nutrition, and health. We'll also be keeping an eye on the gatherings of the International Fresh Produce Association in Washington, as well as the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture in Saratoga Springs, New York. Stay tuned to AgriPulse.com for all of this and the latest on government funding headed into the end of the fiscal year. For AgriPulse Newsmakers, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one. Newsmakers is a production of AgriPulse Communications. For more ag policy news, visit AgriPulse.com. You can also find our new content on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow AgriPulse and our correspondents on social media to get breaking news and more.